furious Italians. Are there any other kind? Corrupt officials. The legendary Jim McLean. Furious again. A seaplane. All of these feature in part one of The Big Interview with Walter Smith, which we recorded on the stunning grounds of Cameron House on the bonny, bonny banks of Loch Lomond. It was going to take something special to outdo that scenery, but Walter managed just that, recalling his time spent working in McLean at Dundee United, at the epicentre of a European revolution in Scottish football, and how that iconic manager inspired loyalty in his players, as well as fear. <laughs> the United side reached the semi-finals of the European Cup, but that campaign ended in Rome on a night made infamous by a crooked referee and the physical threats that Roma's players made to McLean. Walter explains how he helped the United manager escape from the tunnel unscathed, even though he himself took a few sore ones. Walter also talks about winning the European Youth Championship with Scotland in 1982. What do you mean? You didn't know that Scotland had been champions of Europe? They have. It was 82, during an era when it seemed as if the country would always produce exciting, natural footballers. And how only Andy Roxburgh already saw that that talent pool was about to dry up. Listen, enjoy. This is a special, interesting, often very funny guy. I like talking to him, but it was done for you. We are... uh Sitting by the banks of Loch Lomond, it's a privilege and an honour, quite exciting too, after a long time not seeing you, to be with Walter Smith. Walter, thank you very much indeed. I like what you've done with your house, and the garden's not looking too bad. No, no, it was, uh, it was quite nice actually, and um, as you can see, the, the aeroplanes outside. Yeah, uh, you, you keep up, uh, what, they, they're not called biplanes, are they seaplanes? No, they're seaplanes. There is a seaplane about 100 metres from us, and I'd love to tell you that Walter... Uh, arrived in it, but I think we're all going to depart in it. Loch Lomond's looking fine this morning. Is this a parcel of land and a beautiful building that brings back lots and lots of memories for you? This has played a part in your career. Well, uh, when I moved from Dundee United down to, uh, to Rangers, we had, uh, obviously to look at being a Glaswegian, coming back to Glasgow again. Um, well, actually, I was away in the World Cup in, in Mexico with Sir Alec Ferguson and uh, um, my wife was left with the chore of picking a place to live in. We live in Helensburgh and um, we decided on Helensburgh. So we live there and we've lived there for uh, that's 30 years now. So um, No joking though, I mean it's literally stunning. You, you're used to it, but we're sitting in the kind of drawing room that you could film, I don't know, Brideshead Revisited or whatever the, the current one, uh, Downton Abbey in. The grounds are sensational. I, I'm over here from, from Spain out of... Um, a huge respect and admiration for the parts of your career that I was lucky enough to see or report on, meet you to talk about. But before um, we ever met, as, as you were Rangers manager and I was a young journalist, one of the things that strikes me is you went with Andy Roxburgh and won, we won that tournament, <laughs> lifted that trophy against what I hope you'll remind was quite a good Dutch side. And nobody <laughs> talks about it. Nobody even knows about it. Uh, did did it actually it's... happen? Yeah, it's one of those things. Um, I had I had passed through my coaching badges at um, Alargs, and Andy Roxburgh was in charge of the um, the whole setup there, the, the coaching setup. And um, they decided that, um, or the SFA decided that it would be good if uh, the their director of coaching took one of the national teams. And at mm. that time, um, we only had like the under eighteen team, under twenty one team, and the national team. So. Um, Andy was the the manager of the under eighteen team, so um, I had been in the taking Dundee United reserve team as well. I started my coaching in very early, but Jim McLean, and um, I used to take the Dundee United reserve team and take their youth sides as well. So um, Andy asked me if I would join him uh, in the national team setup. So I did that from about nineteen seventy eight seventy nine period, and. Um, we headed to uh, to Finland um, for a tournament there and um, European Championships. And um, we were drawn against Holland, Turkey, and Albania in the, in the, in the sections. It was uh, it was really interesting. Um, Holland had one or two players that uh, you know 
Van Basten and uh, and the like who would go on and play um, and reach world renown and, and play for a, win the Euros in eighty eight. Not that long after, we'd actually had quite a few players: Eric Black, Neil Cooper, um, who had uh, been playing for their club throughout the season and uh, and were away in club duties, and we we, we didn't have them for the finals. Uh, obviously, both of them would have enhanced were 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 team, but we didn't have them. So we were missing one or two players going to Finland, and um, we we managed to to get ourselves through to the final there and um, knocking out Holland en route. Yeah, which is knocking out. So we we did very well, and um, Andy had engendered a good spirit in, in that team. The, there was some really good players in it. They worked extremely hard over the the time that um, that we were in Finland, and. Um, we uh, we won that championship, and not only that, but that obviously got us inclusion into the World Youth Championships in Mexico. Uh, you know, in the following year, it was uh, it was quite an adventure. Paul McStay in your midfield, Paul McStay up front. The ones that stand out is Bowman who played for United. Um, players who I don't remember, Robin Ray and goals, but also Paul McStay, Pat Nevin, Ali Dick. Yeah, they were. bit of a character, Ali, but one of the lost talents. Yeah, of Scottish well, for, football. For Pat Nevin and for Ali, there was a throwback to you know a lot of Scottish wingers as such. You know, like when we always look back and to a period of time when you were playing and a great Celtic team, but they had players like Jimmy Johnson, Rangers had Bobby Henderson. Henderson and there was wingers um, of that type in, in nearly every team um, in, in the country. So it was a it was a bit of a throwback um, that one, but. Uh, Oh, we, we handled it. We handled it very well, and uh, you know, you mentioned some individuals there. But effectively, um, for boys so young, they formed a good team, uh, good work rate. One of my um, players at Dundee United, Gary McKenna, scored a goal against um, Holland, and uh, um, you know that was a, a major result for us. The Dutch were obviously one of the favourites, not only to win the European Championships, but to to go on and. and and lift the, the well World Youth Championships yeah. which in, in Mexico. So, um, a, a, a big result for us. And uh, I, I sometimes feel Andy doesn't get a credit for 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 that uh, for winning that tournament. It's the only time that it's ever happened in our country. Um, That's what I mean. So, is there, I mean, I'm not expecting you to produce a ready-made explanation, but it's a bit weird that we yearn. We we in our souls we all think we're budding world champions. We're gonna we we're always gonna win. We're always the best. One good result and the fire started again. But we win a tournament and it's, it's completely forgotten. What the heck? Well, it, 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 it did get um, forgotten. I can remember, you know, coming back from there, the, the, there was very little media attention um, at that period when a, when a group came back uh, to Scotland as well with the, the, the European Championship. And... Um, you know that was that was something there, but one of the things that, that it was great to be there. It was great to be in that environment. Equally, going on to um, the finals uh, in Mexico was just a, a fantastic experience for for the likes of myself as a young coach to to go and see you know young teams from all over the world um, um, congregate and then come and play it was great. But it was during that period of time that. Um, Andy's job as director of coaching was one that um, obviously stretched a bit deeper than just taking football teams. He had the whole coaching structure to put in place. And um, one day we were away, he said, I have to make a report um, about the future of, of Scottish football um, for the SFA. And um, he said to me, I'll, I'll give you it and I'll let you read it. And in his report, he, he stated that he was concerned that the number of players going to be available for the, for, to the professional game was going to dwindle um, because of the change of environment that was happening within our country. The, no more street football, you know, no more, well, park football as such. And at the time, I, um, I disagreed with them because at Dundee United we had a decent youth policy. Um, so did the other, other clubs. I was seeing players coming through at that early 80s stage, the young players, you mentioned Paul McStay, that, you know, Charlie Nicholas's and, and others that, that were at Celtic and other um, young boys, but they were all coming through. And um, 
So I, I said to Mandy, their, their commentary will always come through. And they but um, when it, you look back now, he was correct. There, there are fewer and fewer talented Scottish players coming to the professional game now. We're getting players that are coming in, but individually talented players are, are few and far between over the last um, 10 odd years. So his assessment of that at that stage... Um, it was quite visionary. W yeah, was, was something that um, when I look back on and, uh, and I see it, I kind of obviously enjoyed the, the winning the European Youth Tournament. I enjoyed um, going to Mexico. But the thing that sticks in my head more than anything else was that report Randy made that assessment um, in 1982, 83. And, um, you wouldn't have thought it possible. Yes. I have to agree. That, that, that listening to that now, if you'd looked around and seen some of the things that we're about to talk about, beating regularly with all 11 Scots in, whether it's Celtic Rangers weren't right then maybe so dominant in Europe, but um, Aberdeen, Dundee United, Celtic beating Ajax a couple of years later, yes. knocking out Cruyff and Ajax. You'd have looked around and thought, it's all happening, it's all coming through. That thing about we always believed it would be perpetual, maybe over the years, and maybe it's natural, maybe it, certain people stop trying, stop being methodical or forward thinking about it because there'd always been a rich seam of players who liked the ball, um, knew what to do with it. Oh, it's, a, it's a lack of forward thinking, you know, more than, than anything else. Um, uh, you know, if nobody had ever mentioned that to me, I wouldn't have blamed them mm -hmm. for not thinking about it. Mm -hmm. But this was a report that was that was sitting there, and, it, and as I say, it's the strangest um, aspect of that period mm -hmm. that well, the, we were enjoying the success of a, a youth team for the first or the only time totally. that Scotland have won that championship. Um, we were enjoying that success, but at the same time, Andy was saying, you know, this is something that in the future is not going to happen. To and it me. fell on deaf ears generally. Yes. I mean, there's no doubt about that. I mean, I mean it did. They obviously had to put the report in front of people at the SFA, but it fell on deaf ears. In fairness to people in Scotland, it hasn't only happened in Scotland. No. It has happened in a great number of countries. And although we only concern ourselves with our own country, um, it, it's happening in more countries than, than we imagine. I think that the standard of individual players that are coming to the professional game um, is, is now as low as it's been, not just in Scotland, but as, as I say, in a, in a lot of countries across Europe. Countries like Iceland have tried to adjust it recently. <laughs> That's the model, I bet. Like. Now, their, their reasons are maybe different from Scotland's. Ours, I think, can be placed in, in terms of negligence, whereas for them, you know, it was always difficult to have a facility for kids to train and, 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 and do that, but they've adjusted to it. Now, we still, I don't think, have adjusted to that aspect of it. This isn't where I was going to go because I, you have always struck me, and I'd like to say we share a fascination for aspects of continental football, and that's the main reason for this big interview today. But by the time you take over, successfully at Scotland um, before moving back to Rangers. Had things noticeably changed in the SFA in terms of vision, forward planning, openness to the need to radically change our ability to develop and seed good football players and good football coaches at youth level? Yeah, it has changed. Uh, it's in the process of changing. Um, at the present moment, I think in Scotland we, we became aware of that aspect of it, and I think now they're they're, they're trying very hard to to do something about it. A little bit disappointing in terms of the timing. We've left it late. Yeah. But it's better now that we that we do it um, rather than not approach it. And we're doing so now. I'm, I'm starting to live it through my my grandkids. You know, you, you have grandkids who come and, and play, and you actually see what they have to do um, to enjoy their football uh, in comparison to what I had to do to enjoy mine. Mine was just to walk out the door and go to a local park. There was always a game. You, know, you could walk out the door and there'd be a game in the street. It was always there. Um, now um, the kids have to be taken to wherever they've got to be. The logistic aspects of it um, put a pressure on parents. There's absolutely no doubt about it. 
but uh, now the facilities are there and I think we're just beginning to awaken to the fact that you know we need to use the facilities that we have, we need to try and find a way of doing it. Schools are starting to go back now to have football teams and different things like that and I think we're starting to see uh, a circumstance where we are getting kids to play the requisite number of hours that's required to make them good at whatever they're going to do. And an understanding about what we do with those hours, that they need to be on the ball, that they need to be enjoying, yes. just the, developing their touch. No, there's no secret to, to play football. You know, that, that, that it's just to play football. It develops through a circumstance that, um, and I don't think at any age, I mean, if I look, my grandkids are, are my two oldest, the boys are nine. So, you know, they've been playing for, for three, four years now and they, they play away and they love playing. So that for them, I think, is the thing about it. Where do they go to play nowadays? You know, that, that's it. They can't just go out into the street. They can't do that. Their parents have to take them there. Their grandparents have to take them. I, I'm it's doing an active that. choice yes. rather than just wondering, that, there's my opportunity. Just something that your parents were involved in. The parents have to be involved in this. And this is where um, we still have a, a problem and a lot of of um, the, the more deprived areas in, in, in our country. We still have to have a circumstance here where I think we are just to them more than, than, than anything else. We were all brought up in working class societies in, in, in Glasgow and football was, was the main thing that we did do. Now there are other aspects that, that develop that takes kids' attention. But nobody's going to tell me that kids nowadays don't love playing football. Nobody's going to tell me that we have a circumstance that um, once they start to play, uh, they've not got their heroes. They've got them all now. Whereas ours used to be Scottish. Nowadays, we're getting it that the television's made it that they have heroes in Barcelona and, and Madrid and Munich and you know all over um, Europe. They'll pick players that they love. You go to the grandkids' training sessions and they've all got foreign football club jerseys on. I mean, so... Um, the the circumstance you. changes. Thank you. But I like that. Yeah. As long as it's no, but the based. circumstance changes. Yeah. But um, you know, the fact is that all we need is to get them to play as much football as they possibly can, and we're, they're making inroads in that. The SFA have started to to do that now. Would it be a tremendous boost for this process that you're talking around about around the country if there were six or seven more? full-size indoor stadium with 4G surfaces. Yeah, I don't think there's, a, the, the, there's any doubt that, you know, that it's, it's, it's a necessary factor um, for us to, to do that. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, when we look at the problems that we have, social problems that we have in Scotland, maybe people would say, well, you know, why spend all that money and doing all that when we could be doing it and, and other things. I can see that point. The but argument is if you get kids fit and you get kids off the street and enjoying themselves and playing yes. football, then that has an immediate impact on the very social problems that people they want to throw money at. Yeah, that's what, that would be my argument, but uh, well, uh, let's, I think we're, slightly, like we're slightly biased teasing it out. Uh, in the sense that that's also what, right. And that's what we want to do. Um, nail it for, we've a lot of younger listeners who are exactly in the situation that you talked about, who've never really seen, they've heard about street football. Like yeah. that you could literally go out. Describe that specifically growing up, wherever you grew up, Lanark or East End? I, I, I grew up in, I, I grew up in Carmyle, just um, um, about maybe two or three miles from Celtic Park. Um, I was there, just on the edge of the city boundaries uh, down there. So, um, like, I, I mean, like every other kid at, at the time, it was a small village, there's only maybe 1,500, 2,000 people in it. They are surrounded by steelworks and um, etc. Um, but enjoyable childhood, and most of that was spent playing football. And, um, but literally, I mean, because that's what they did. It, these aren't golden, I know, because, you know, we're slightly different ages, but I grew up this, with the same focus, but always out with the ball, yeah, run the grass into mud. But you're literally talking about there's always a game, street, you could always park, find a whatever. Game. You could always find a game in a village. It didn't matter, you know, if you went out, especially if you owned the ball. If you had a ball, <laughs> you know, you were always popular. But, um, you know, you would go down and there was a park 
just 50 yards from where I lived and there was always a, a game there. And I, it might have been um, sometimes two aside and sometimes it might have been ten aside, it didn't matter. You know, and they didn't bother too much about, you know, odd numbers or anything like that. I mean, he just went down and he picked a team. And one of the more remarkable things in the days of bibs and things like that that we have and all the equipment that we have, that we used to um, um, just pick the teams. And um, yeah, it was one of those things you soon got to know who was on your team and who wasn't. And there was no indication, jersey-wise or otherwise, um, um, that that was the case. But that, that's what we did in, that, that, in Glasgow. That would have been a circumstance in any street. Everybody played, and you played between the lampposts and the fences were the goals, and um, and he played, and that was where um, you learned your football there, and as I say, in the parks. Playing in the street has always fascinated me because you have to use your head a little bit. A strange thing, I, I was driving into Glasgow the other day, and I saw my big canvas advert. Do you want to play street football? And um, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, what, how they go about it or what they're going to do. But do you want to play street football? And it took me back and, I, I, and I thought, well, that's great. So I, I just wonder how they're going to do it. And I don't know the setup. I just thought, but that's where the majority of kids learn to play. We, we, um, the second thing I wanted to pick up on is that you talked about nowadays, like the, the kids' heroes as they grow up will maybe be in Munich or Milan or Barcelona or wherever. Television, the internet, doesn't matter, marketing. When you first get hit by European football, where is it? Who is it? I, had, um, I think, uh, you know, the early days, my grandfather was a, he lived with us, uh, I lived with the family, and uh, he was um, a Ranger supporter, and he, uh, he took me to Ibrox, and I remember, you know, going and having big nights. I remember going to a game against Eintracht Frankfurt, and, uh, Semi-final, a uh, cup winners cup or uh, whatever it was, way back in the and, uh, early Six, 60s. Yeah, yeah. Way back in the early 60s. And that, that was my first kind of recollection of, of going. Um, it's going to be 67. To, yeah. I, I just remember going there. Uh, the kind of, um, the, the, the vaguish memories, of, you know, at the present moment, because you were, you were younger. And then um, I started to go uh, and play myself and... Then I signed for Dundee United in November 1966. I was going to say 96 there, which so I wish it was. It's not, it was 1966. And they they beat Barcelona. So they did. On the two occasions, just on the weeks that I, I, I was leading up to me signing for them as a, as a young boy. And um, they, uh, they they beat Barcelona on two occasions, 3-2 on two occasions. And, uh, and Jerry Kerr's team there was full of boys who were good professional players and uh, and it was there and they had two fantastic results uh, um, it was there so that was a kind of um, that must have been earth introductory um, kind of aspect uh, even at a professional end of the game you know but that was there so I suppose that that was the uh, that was the start professionally and then you know you always started to go the Celtic and Rangers reaching European finals you know for Cup Winners Cup, and Celtic winning the European Cup, and things like that brought, you know, European football into focus for a, a youngster. But I don't think that we had the in-depth knowledge of the clubs who were coming from it was foreign impossible countries then, wasn't that it? we do now. You're, you know, you have you play some European football for United. And, um, <laughs> I did do. And yeah. I, no, you did, you did. And I'm, I'm not going to ask you for a minute by minute of September 1977, but I love the fact that you... You'd go on to sign his son, but you play against Finn Loudrup for Dundee United against Copenhagen. So I want to talk about the transformation between playing Brian and Michael Loudrup's dad, Finn Loudrup, in Copenhagen and losing 3-0 in 77, and then Locker in, not able to beat Locker in, in 1980. And by 1981, your coach with Jim as the manager, Dundee United 5, Borussia Mönchengladbach 0. It's the Borussia Mönchengladbach of Jupp Heynckes with Lothar Matthias playing sweeper defender. Right throughout the team, there's absolute quality. At that stage, Borussia Mönchengladbach are competitors for the German title, regularly doing well in Europe. And I'll just read it again. 5-0. Ralph Milne, Billy Kirkwood, Paul Sturt, Paul Hegarty, Eamon Bannon, you and Jim McLean. And it begins there. Describe 
the feeling of being able to take on big European clubs and beat them regularly? What happened? What was it like? What memories do you have of playing? Well, that, that one game, I think, more than anything else, gave Dundee United, uh, as a club, uh, uh, a sort of more prominent position in, in European football. People sat up and, and took notice for a Scottish team out with Rangers and Celtic to win in the manner that United did that night. It was great. But Tannadice was a, 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 it's a tight pitch. It's, um, it's a fantastic atmosphere at, at, at Tannadice in European nights. And, um, and on that night, everything about our team just seemed to click. And we played extremely well. And we got ourselves, you know, into that one in position and kept going. And uh, I must admit, it was a, a fantastic performance um, by us um, overall. And, you know, I think more than anything else, that that, that night, that um, Jim McLean's work with Dundee United, you know, I think that night, I, I think even Jim himself, you know, could see the progression. And I think that meant more to him than, uh, than, than the result, which would echo around Europe as saying, you know, 5 0, Borussia, Borussia Mönchengladbach. and Gladbach. Uh, how, how, how did they do that? How, how did they manage to? Um, but ha having been there as a player and then asked to go into the staff as coaching, I, I could see the work that Jim McLean did um, and, and the other, and it's down to him. I mean, it, it, you know, people say to me, I ah, were a coach there and you were assistant manager there. Yeah, you play a part, but the whole club was Jim McLean at that time. And uh, he he's the person that deserves um, more credit for United's rise than anyone. It, I, I can't go by that without asking about Jim because the Jim now, I think, is predominantly remembered for having this ferocious temper. Players now talk about you're smiling because I don't know a millionth of it. The players now, when we went to do the big interview with uh, David Moyes, Billy McKinley was there and Billy told some stories. And that was in the latter days when Jim had probably become PC. The long and short is, I'm saying that despite Jim being very particular, very unusual and doing things that wouldn't be allowed now, there must have been some vision, some talent there that's, that's oh, probably I, I, now... Neglected yeah. when people talk about him. That's that. That's a, the the thing. The, the managers then, um, you know, were probably more demanding of people than than currently. You know, the demands the demands on a football just, footballer just now are there for everyone. They pay massive fees for them. They get in a, in, a, in a lot of cases they get paid massive fees for them and things like that. But then it wasn't the case. You know, the, the managers and coaches felt they had to. To be a driving force, and and that was Jim. Um, but I mean, everybody played, and played for him. So you know, I, I, it's one of those things that you know um, we were all myself as a player and uh, on a on the wrong end of um, of one of his his rants. But by the same token, um, there's no player who went into Dundee United uh, came out a poorer player. Every one of them enhanced their careers by having played at Dundee Why? Because United. he taught them? Yeah, because he, 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 the circumstance, he was meticulous in terms of what he did and what he wanted specifically on the pitch. You've got to say that the players at Dundee United responded to that. I'm not saying that they enjoyed it a lot of the time. Nobody would, would enjoy it, but they enjoyed the results of it. And it got the majority of them careers that maybe yeah. they might not have had. I was there, so I mean, and there's a, a, a lot made of you know Sir Alec Ferguson and his, his hair dryer treatment and his things like that, and Jim McLean, people that know him. But and these people had players that followed them to success. Now that's the, that's the bottom line. It's not all about bowling and shouting and and that's and bullying and getting there. It's and that, not at all. Those stereotypes lingered far, far too yes. long. Yeah, the, the main thing is. That for Scottish football, during that period, you know, Sir Alec Ferguson, Jim McLean, Jock Stein, uh, and others, they, they, these people, you know, were fantastic managers and coaches, you know, at the time. And they brought a profile to Scotland that, you know, we never really had when you look at 
our league, you know, then Rangers, Celtic, Dundee United, Aberdeen, Hearts. Uh, the, the period of the late 70s into the early 80s. There was a fantastic period football-wise for Scotland. Was there a craftiness about those three men about how to get into players' heads? There's a famous story about Jock saying to Jimmy Johnson, who hated flying, if you make sure that this team's hammered. But I've, and I've seen Sir Alex been just as shrewd about getting into the mind of a player. Do you know what I mean? Graham, every, 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 everybody looks back at successful people and brings specific stories. They, they, these people, um, they, you know, they're, they're the leaders. They make demands on people. That's what you do when, when you've got to lead. And as I say, the one thing uh, from my own point of view, as it, was, it was a great period, uh, you know, um, in Scotland, they're the last great period of, of players and the fact that we, we had fantastic players like Sinus and Doug Leach and others there that were among the best players in the world. But we also had a, a group of coaches and managers that were taking teams to be the best. Everybody who listens to the big interview knows my allegiance to Pataudry. So therefore, it was just devastating every time United, your United came up and Paul Sturrock would play as if he was Pelé. Routinely, United would win at Pataudry. But given the years have passed a little bit, I'm willing to cede a little bit of space to the other half of the new firm and say, done United, were damn good. And I remember a phone call once, years ago now, you telling me something that I hadn't known in the 80s, that AC Milan, or at least maybe a group of Italian sides, sent an expedition to United and to Aberdeen to spend time, early 80s I'd say, to try and watch training, to try and learn, to try and say, what is it that these small provincial clubs have got right? Do I remember that conversation correctly? And, and yes. Um, we, what, what went on? Well, we, we, um, they decided that um, they were looking at teams in Scotland and saying, well, how come a country of five million people is producing these teams who, who can play? And remember, we didn't have a circumstance then where we had a whole lot of foreign players playing in a team. Uh, there were, you know... Very, uh, very if, few if, then. If we looked, there's very, very few yeah. at that period. If we're looking at Aberdeen, um, Dundee United, Rangers and Celtic, there was very few foreign players. So they looked at that. So what they did was they, 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 they brought their, their whole... Um, everyone who was sitting, it's, it's a, their, their course was a year in Cover Channel, we're, we're the final part of it. It's their equivalent of large, is, is, is it? a year, more or less, full time. And they take their coaches around and they decided to come to Scotland to do that and they turned up to our, our training at, um, at Dundee United, they turned up to Aberdeen, to Rangers, to Celtic. And um, they, um, they then sent the... Um, this booklet over and back to, to Dundee United where they, they had stayed with us for a week and looked at all the training and uh, everything that we, that we did and had conversations with Jim McLean. Unfortunately for us it was in Italian <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, which none of us could understand but the, the actual drawings and the, 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 um, the football exercises that they had taken down were all there and the, their whole um, book was, was an in-depth book about the trip um, to, to Scotland. But going abroad to play then, um, I want you, I'm showing a picture that doesn't come up well on podcasts, but it's the semi-final of the European Cup. You and Jim McLean um, are beating Roma 2-0 at Tannadice. And there's a photo here um, in a game which when I was watching it, didn't look as if the referee was neutral. That's my position. And you and Jim McLean, two Two tough soldiers, you wouldn't easily be cowed, are surrounded by Roma players. Um, one of them looks as if he's about to jump you, the other one is middle fingering you, they're up close. Those three would be banned now for, I don't know, six or seven years. Leo Messi, yesterday, had been banned for four international matches, which will see Argentina probably not qualify for the World Cup in Russia. And... Uh, that photo, which is iconic, represents a brutal, brutal night where not only am I talking about the fact that Roma won 3-0, there are huge suspicions over how that happened. In my case, you can speak for yourself. But European football didn't used to be Champions League and nice and safe and in, out and everybody pats each other on the back and it's all stewarded and marshalled. 
even in the, in the early 80s. There was an element of the Wild West about it. Give me, give me, give the, I've described that beautifully for the people listening. Tell me the background to that picture. Tell me what memories it stimulates. Uh, well, we, um, Dundee United, as I already said, Tannadice was an imposing place to, to, to go and play. And, um, you know, the final of the European Cup at that time was going to be played in Roma Stadium. So there was a massive pressure on them. Uh, it's the Olympic Stadium in Rome, the venue for the final, gives them a great opportunity. So when it came to Tannadice, we were sitting there, it was 0-0 half time, and as usual, having a slight slope at Tannadice, we, we start the second half, and I remember Jim saying at half time, look, we're doing really well, we, we played really well, he said, you know, but we've got to try and turn this into goals, and, um, you know, like to, to try and get an advantage. And um, you could see that Roma were a little bit rattled out of their, their normal way of, of, of playing. And um, we got a couple of goals. Won the game 2-0. Um, during the game, the ball had bounced down towards our dugout and um, the, uh, Jim had got the ball and had bounced it back to um, one of the players who was coming up to, to get it. And um, that was, there was a kind of, the, the player said something Italian to him but looked kind of aggressive. I couldn't understand why at the time. Uh, no, I mean, that, that was, so basically nothing happened in the game. And um, we won the match, and afterwards they, they were accusing Dundee United of drugs, and taking, you know, after the game, the president was saying, how could they run around like that for 90 minutes, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't know that. All, all this kind of thing. So um, when we arrived, and it was noticeable that there was a great deal of animosity towards our, our, our team when we were there. And we thought it was just a, that was one of the things that happens, you know, they're making sure we feel as uncomfortable as possible. Uh, so um, the waiters in the hotel were none too friendly, unlike Italian people in, in, in general. Yeah. And um, so it was a kind of hostile atmosphere, even out with them. So um, we go to the game and the, Obviously, getting to the stadium and all the rest of the stuff, everything was hostile. The whole environment was. So is it to uh, get to the stadium? Does it reach the I still had stage no idea of... why this was taking place, except for the fact that I thought this was a ploy on behalf of the air to, to, to sort of... Does it feel threatening in any way? You know, with the, with the fans well, and the boss and that? Well, it, 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 it was, but I mean, when the game was finished, um, that was there. And I must say, the, the referee was later found to have um, taking bribes, he was found guilty of, of, of that. Yeah. So, um, did, did, that did, I must do you say, see that during the game? No, I must say in the game. You know, like when I was there, I don't think there was a, a decision there that I would have said, you know, turn the game or, or anything like that. You've got to remember that Roma were a really good team, but the referee, as I say, and maybe 10 years, 15 years later, Got found guilty yeah. of taking bribes, not just in that game, but in a number of European games. And I couldn't understand the hostility. That picture was taken that you showed me there was taken um, after the game. And um, we got into a tunnel, and the tunnel there was a tunnel, but the door to the dressing room was halfway up the tunnel, and it was only an ordinary door. And that was all. And you walked up a flight of stairs into the dressing room. So it started to get kind of nasty. Um, as we got towards the, I mean, so Jim managed to escape up uh, and left uh, John Gardner, the reserve goalie, and I to kind of hold them off. But afterwards, what actually happened was that they, they, they had, they had, when Roma had gone back to the, the, their manager Neil Leto, who's a Swedish manager, legend, the famed, the legendary manager, had said that on the altercation um, in the first game, the first game at the dugout between Conte and Jim McLean was um, one where um, Jim had um, sworn at and called him an Italian whatever, right? Now, I was there with him and he didn't. So they exaggerated this whole case. 
that was that was European football. The stakes were high for for both the clubs. For me, the the, the biggest disappointment was you know for Jim McLean to take a, a provincial team like Dundee United to that level and have an opportunity through winning two 0 for the first game was a, was probably goes down as one of the biggest disappointments. Uh, if anything, maybe Jim deserved a, a day in the sun, if you like, in terms of putting them up there with the, the very best European managers of reaching a European Cup final. The Big Interview is produced by Backpage and me, Graham Hunter. The music you always hear, the music that you love, is Beer Jacket. You can enter exclusive competitions and put your questions to our future Big Interview guests by getting on the mailing list at grahamhunter.tv. Yes, several thousand of you have done it, but come on, slackers at the back, sign up. Thanks for being there. Without you, this would be fun, but a lot less fun. See you soon.